Thank you for joining us on The Skeptic Sidekick, where we delve into ancient societies, the ghosts, the paranormal, UFOs, all looking at it from the perspective of the true believer and from the skeptic perspective. Joining me, my partner, my co-host, my sibling, Kimber Rodriguez. Myself, I am Richard Gregg. And again, let's look into being the skeptic psychic. Welcome once again to uh, what we like to call the encore episode of the uh, Thighs Fleet. The only reason why we're calling it the encore is that the fact that it didn't really come up uh, correctly for us. So here we are again, redoing a, uh, a another wonderful episode of uh, the Skeptic Psychic. With me today is uh, my ever fabulous co-host, a girl so sweet she'd uh, make candy jealous. My sister, Kimber Rodriguez. How are you doing today, Kimber? I'm doing pretty good. How are you today? We're doing fine. Anything new on your end? No, nothing much. Same here. Boy, our lives are, are confusing and boring. Yes. So we, we decided we were going to do uh, a uh, cryptid. What cryptid are, in fact, are, have we been re-recording? Re well, we're covering one of my favorites, the thylacine, which is more commonly known by their nicknames, the Tasmanian tiger. Or an even cuddlier Tassie tiger. Now, the Tassie tiger is the marsupial of Australia and Tasmania. And the reason it's considered a cryptic is because there are questions as to whether it's actually extinct or not. And if it is really extinct, did it happen as long ago as scientists claim? So, marsupial, what does that mean? Marsupials have pouches for their young. Um, these would be like the kangaroo, the duck, the duck nosed platypus, and more commonly, the only one that we have here in the U.S. Our cuddly, lovable friend, the possum. Uh mm huh. -hmm. I I know about possums. Yes, they're adorable. Maybe. Hey, they eat ticks for you, keep them off your dogs. They are not rabid. They're just misunderstood. But let's get back to the tiger. All righty. Let's get into the history. All righty. The Tasmanian tiger, or the thysaline, is a carnivorous marsupial lived on the Australian continent long before. Sea levels rose, separating Tasmania from the lane, mainland approximately 12,000 years ago. By the arrival of the European uh, settlers to Tasmania in 1800, only an estimate of 5,000 existed on the island. It was extinct for already 1,000 years in mainland Australia by the time settlers arrived there. Since the European settlements, all of Australia, uh, Australia's large meaning species, heavier than one uh, kilogram or even a little over two pounds, marsupials, carv uh, marsupial carnivores have declined. Now there are three possibilities. The Tassie tiger is extinct. The Tasmanian devil is endangered and many others listed as endangered or vulnerable. The spotted tail quo, which is now the largest marsupial carnivore in mainland uh, Australia, has died off in many, many regions. What about the Tasmanian tiger? Um, we can talk about the various animal extinction level events taking place around the world or in the great down under, but it's the tiger itself that we're here to discuss, right? Right you are. We need to take a, a few steps back first to describe the odd little branch of evolution. Europeans arrived on the continent about 1800, only an estimated 5,000 Tasmanian tiger forming around Tasmania. While only 5,000 in one location in Australia, 70% of the co uh, continent is arid and desolate. 30% of it should provide enough water and game. And it did for a time on the western part of the continent, long before the Aborigines. Large and genetic diverse population of the Tassies thrived. On the eastern side of the continent, harsh conditions made living difficult. 
climate shift from the last ice age, increasingly warm weather, seas rising, unable to adapt and begin to decline as Eastern animals died, struggle to maintain a diverse breeding population. Aboriginal settlers arrived between 4,000 to 100,000 years ago, pushed the shy marsupial into smaller territories with the dwindling breeding diversity. The end had already begun for them before the Abor Aborigines arrived. As the Aboriginal settlers arrived between 4,000 to 100,000 years ago, they pushed the shy marsupials into smaller territories. This caused dwindling breeding diversity. However, the end had already begun for them before the Abor Aborigines arrived. The Aboriginals did hunt for the tiger for food, as well as the animals they preyed upon. Another threat, the dingoes, arrived nearly 4,000 years ago. Tassie ter territory on the continent shrank, shrank rapidly with the dingo appearance, and the op Australian population went into a free fall. Now, for those who don't know the Australian history, Dingoes have been traced to an early breed of domestic dog from Asia, and they would have traveled to the continent via Asian seafarers. Its size made it now the largest mammal carnivore. Now, while mostly sol solitary hunters, the dingoes will form large packs and go after a bigger game. They are also opportunistic hunters eating insects, birds, reptiles, kangaroos, koalas, rabbits, wallabies, and eventually domestic livestock. As the dingoes population boomed, they expanded rapidly across the Australian landscape. Now, the Tasmanian tiger being a smaller creature retreated further and further south. You see, the dingoes will fiercely defend their perceived territory. And since the Tassie tigers were a solitary ambush style predator rather than shy, the shift in territory probably went without much of a fight. Now, just for reference, a grown dingo is about five foot long from head to toe. I'm sorry, from the head to the tip of the tail. And the tail is a total of a one and a half meters. Tassies were no longer than your average coyote, which is about three feet or just about 0.9 centimeters. Now, if you got a couple of dingoes together or given one the perfect opportunity, the tassie had no choice but to flee or become the dingo dinner. Not to be invited to the dinner, but rather we're having you for dinner. Now, while the first Europeans to reach the Australian shores were the Dutch, was a Dutch navigator named William Jansoon in 1906, the Europeans actually did not settle the Australian shores until the British began ferrying convicts in 1788. By this point, the tiger was already extinct on the continent and was now living in geographical isolation on its a Tasmanian island. The island size keeping the population numbers low. Now in 1803, uh, settlers moved on to the island of Tasmania. They cleared the large areas of uh, farming and fencing area for sheep and cattle. Even though the shy Tassie was rarely seen by settlers, they were seen as a pest and blamed for death of livestock. So basically they were blamed for what probably the dingoes were doing. But by 1830, a bounty was set up for each Tassie killed. The farmers were pulling their money together to pay for each skin turned in. The government stepped in in 1888, began covering the bounty program, extending it to nearly 80 years, ending it in 1909. The government paid for 2,180 tiger deaths. Estimate that are at least 35, 
35,000 animals, or 3,500, excuse me, were killed through the hunting between 1830 and the 1920s, whether paid a bounty or not. Studies since have proven since while the Tasmanian tigers were ballast to open this draw is extremely wide, science disagrees whether it opened 80 degrees wider or up to 120 degrees. The carnivore's jaw was so weak that it would likely couldn't kill anything larger than the possum and smaller rodents it hunted. There are certain reports that uh, kangaroos were found missing their heads. It is thought that, that the Tazi gnawed at these from each animals that are already dying or deceased to take food to a quiet spot to eat. The last known shooting of a wild Tasmanian tiger was in 1930. Now, there are pictures of a farmer by the name of Whiff Batty grinning at a camera, posing it with his dog next to what appears to be a dead animal he had propped upright. He had claimed the animal, thought to be a male, had been seen around his farm for several weeks and was shot after he discovered him in his hen house. The publisher published the photo around the time it showed the tiger with a hint in its mouth. Images have been thought to be posed using a taxidermy tiger with a dead chicken wired to its mouth. Uh, do you have that picture for us, Ken? Or yes. we're not going to worry about pictures. Yes, um, I would rather not show that picture since, you know, there are some people who are anti-hunting and I don't want to cause issues. So right. I'm not going to show that one. But I will show this one of the thiacine showing his jaws. Okay. Are you able to see my screen? Yes. Okay, here's a picture of what the thylacine looked like. Um, this is an actual thylacine who was kept in a zoo. And we'll go through his story a little later. But as you can see how wide his jaw is open here. Um, and how small he actually is. Um, to me, he looks about the size of a house dog. Uh, although I'd say slightly smaller. Mm, it depends on the type of breed of dog. But just wanted to share that for our viewers and listeners. Well, and our viewers. <laughs> That is a picture of Benjamin, the last known recorded uh, Tassie. Yes, and we'll go through his story in just a bit. But by the mid-1930s, sightings in the wild were incredibly rare, and conservationists grew concerned, pushing for a protective status. However, the efforts came too late. Um, as you mentioned, the last known Tassie was named Benjamin, and he was captured in 1933. He died in the Beaumaris Zoo, which is now known as the Hobart Zoo. Um, poor Benjamin died from exposure and neglect in 1936. The reason is that no one provided adequate shelter during an unseasonably cold spell. He died only 59 days after the protected status went into effect. Searches were made for other specimens for zoos, but none were found. And the animal was officially listed as extinct in 1986. Recent studies from the University of Tasmania suggest that the animal may well have existed until the late 1990s or even the early 2000s. Now, while scientists accept that the animal went extinct, some acknowledge that perhaps there could still be a few animals that still live in the most remote parts of Tasmania out of sight from civilization. Benjamin was recorded on video not long after his capture and the film clip was recently colorized showing a tawny color coat and dark stripes iconic to the animal. The video of Benjamin and all surviving pictures taken of other thylacines in the zoo captivity show the exact same horrifying conditions. Small cages where the animal had nowhere to hide or take shelter to sleep, hardly enough room to pace in. And pacing is mostly what Benjamin does in this small video clip. His only form of exercise 
and you can actually see a sign of stress in caged animals. Um, I'm definitely sure that a lot of the pacing did have to do with stress because of the fact that he didn't have any shade, he didn't have any shelter, um, he was just on a hard ground, con looks concrete, so, you know, he couldn't even get comfortable anywhere, so I'm sure he was pretty stressed out, and it was horrible conditions to keep any creature in. All right, and we can also go into the uh, controversial talk of bringing the Tasmanian tiger back out of extinction. Yes, but there is controversy as science considers the Tassie as a potential candidate for de-extinction. The National Museum of Australia holds what is possibly the only known wet specimen kept in preserving fluid. For those of you who don't know, wet specimens means that they uh, pretty much have put them in formaldehyde and have keeping them uh, there. Yes, um, this is the best way to try and preserve the DNA of the creature. They also do have pelts and skeletons and over 30 assorted and preserved body parts. The costs involved are astronomical. In 1999, paleontologist Michael Archer of the Australian Museum committed $57 million to clone the animal from old specimens. It was considered a fantasy given the current technology and the project was shut down in 2005. Since then, genetic advancements have grown. However, the DNA genome was not able to be completely recovered as the samples have degraded over time. Science is most clo much closer to cloning the woolly mammoth as it still has a close relative in today's elephant. However, missing DNA sequence can be borrowed from an elephant where necessary, and hopes are high to reintroduce the mammoth to the Siberian tundra within the decade. The Tasmanian tiger's closest living relative is the numbat. A tiny marsupial that looks like a miniature cross between an anteater and a ground squirrel. The problem is that the numbat itself is also on the verge of extinction. With conservation efforts in place, the number is starting to recover, but there are still less than a thousand left in the wild. The Australian Perth Zoo is the only one in the world that has been uh, breed numbats in, ca in captivity. Since 1993, they have raised and released over 220 of these animals into the wild. Yes, and you can see how tiny the, the numbat is. He's kind of like a squirrel size. Right. So it would not be very plausible to try to use it to clone the Tasmanian tiger with. Well, the uh, Perth Zoo was able to get blood samples. Uh, and despite the fact uh, the little numbat being so small, 95% of its DNA matches the Tasmanian tiger. But it's still a long way to go with uh, sequencing the uh, Tassie correctly. The odds of a thysaline being slated for de-extinction are good. Its original habitat has remained largely unchanged in Tasmania. Scientists feel that there, it may be a good thing to reinduce it would be beneficial to both the ecosystem as well as uh, the population. A uh, five million philanthropic gift to the, from the Wilson Family Trust was given to the University of Melbourne to establish a world-class research lab focused on de-extinction and marsupial con uh, conservation. The lab would not only move forward with the Tasmanian and the tiger, but also assist in other uh, programs working with Australian marsupials, say like the kangaroo, wallaby, that sort of thing. One of the biggest issues, though, isn't finishing with the DNA sequence, crossing your fingers, or hoping it's uh, going to work. There's no way to guarantee the entire genome will be the exact original animal. Even harder, it would be difficult to reintroduce the thysaline back into the wild. The numbat is being bred from living animals and has relatives that could mimic and forge the skills. 
giving it at east termites, it doesn't have to have a fast braid to learn how to hunt or chase down. You're right. The Tasmanian tiger does not have anyone, excuse me, does not have anyone to teach it hunting skills. Zookeepers can try to introduce wild game to the animal while it remains in their care. However, it's more than just showing the animal what it can eat. How do you teach it to survive in the wild? What if there are really still members of the family out there in the wild? What would they think of this reintroduced animal? Would they be weary of something similar but slightly different from them? Would they be willing to mate with it? Or would it retreat yet further from this doppelganger and allow itself to truly become extinct? Now, the Tassie tiger does have a group of firm believers who still think that there are some of these exclusive creatures living and breeding in the wild. There are hundreds of trail cameras that have been set up not only in Tasmania, but in parts of Australia as well, in hopes of catching and documenting their existence. Now, why Australia when they were last seen in Tasmania? Because there have been over 7,000 sightings of the marsupial on the southern mainland. In fact, one man named Neil Waters has started a group called the Thylacine Awareness Group of Australia, also known as TAGOA. Now, this was started back in 2014. He believes there may be a thousand or more Tasmanian tigers currently in the Australian bush. But why should Neil be forced to start this on his own? Now, the reason for that is because without DNA samples to prove the sightings, the Australian and Tasmanian governments are reluctant to waste resources on their own investigations. And this is hardly surprising as many species thought to be extinct are being rediscovered. There is the famous colacanth, or I'm sorry, the famous silicanth, thought to be extinct for 400 million years. The science world was astounded when a living specimen came up in a fisherman's net back in 1938. And it just turns out that the ancient and elusive fish was thriving deep in the oceans of South Africa. Now, getting closer to home for the Tasmanian tiger, in 2016 in New Guinea, which is to the north of Australia, they discovered the New Guinea singing dog, also known as the Highland dog. And this is closely related to the dingo. It has been more than 50 years since a confirmed sighting had taken place and the animal had assumed to be extinct for decades. Not distinct, but extinct. It wasn't distinct. <laughs> New Guinea is also the world's second largest island with a population density average of 36 people per square mile. Despite the loud high-pitched singing and screams, the animal had simply relocated to, remote, to a remote region of the island away from society. New Guinea also recently discovered the big-eared bat when it was accidentally caught in a bat trap. Now this bat was thought to be extinct for 120 years. Its loss of habitat now listed as critically endangered and conservation efforts are underway to keep it from going extinct for real. I know we keep using examples from the Oceana region, but it fits with today's podcast. Another example is Australian's Lord, uh, Lord Howe Island. They used to have a plentiful species of a stick insect the locals have called the tree lobster. It was so prevalent that the natives would use it uh, regularly as fishing bait. It is thought to have been gone extinct in 1920 after a supply ship went aground, introducing rats to the island. Scientists on the island discovered 24 of the insects living beneath a single shrub and captured two breeding pairs. The results of this offsprings were reintroduced back into the island and successfully repopulated the species. 
The rats also caused the extinction of five species of land birds and 12 other invertebrate species and two species of local plant life. And because we're curious, we discovered that the Lord Howell Islands spent 16, at 16 million on a red eradication program in 2019 before releasing the tree lobster back into the wild. A breeding pair of rats were spotted on the island in, uh, in early 2021 who were quickly captured and killed. Most likely they came onto, uh, came onto the island on a ship and were not part of the original population. It may be just a matter of time before another set of rodents escape a ship and just set a whole chain of reaction set up again. But then again, we hope not. Back to Neil Waters and his uh, Ty Tycota. Uh, we will leave the link to his uh, website in the show notes. Neil's list not only has his videos and still photographs and written documentation of his findings, he also includes witness statements in both Australia and Tasmania, interview videos, as well as audio from radio interviews, links to all the information you could possibly want regarding the animal's history, and a large collection of historical images of Tassie. One of the reasons, he says, he's starting the website was that he was dumbfounded that there was so much information that wasn't in the public arena. He and the others used what he called basic citizen science to find concrete evidence of the Thysalene's current existence. They employ not only cameras, but also therm thermal energy imaging drones. Night vision cameras have not only captured what he believes to be true sightings, but also other wildlife not often seen in the bush. Neil has a Facebook group with over 11,000 followers to date, all sharing their sightings. The Facebook page allows people a safe place to talk about their information where they won't be able to be laughed at or ridiculed. Neil feels that the world is in dire needs of good news stories right about now and anything that gives people hope and a bit of focus on the future is gonna be a good thing. The sightings are not just one or two people. For instance, there is a bus full of tourists a uh, family have gone on record they've spotted a mother and cubs, or joeys, as they're often called, playing her, by her side by side in the same area multiple times. Individuals have claimed to see them crossing the road in front of them in broad daylight. Paw prints have been cast in plaster and measured bearing the distinctive paw design of no webbing between the toes that dogs or dingoes would normally have. Dysalines have also have three interdigital pads that have been fused together to form a single trilobed pad, which is in smaller size in, out, in the outback, including dogs and dingoes do not have. Now, we do have a picture of just a comparison from the dog, the Tasmanian devil, and the thysaline. If you want to go ahead and pull that up, Kim, or, or do you discuss a little bit more about the images? Those trail camera images have not only shown what appear to be the Tassie's distinctive stripes, but also the rear facing pouches that both the male and female have. The only other marsupials to share these backward facing pouches are koalas, wombats, and the marsupial moles. The only other marsupial to share these backward facing pouches are koalas, wombats, and wombats and marsupial moles. The only marsupials to have pouches on, their, on the male are the water possum, which can only be found from Mexico to Argentina and not in Australia or Tasmania at all. And did you know that the stripe on each Tasmanian tiger is individual to the animal itself? They don't repeat exactly the same from animal, am, animal to animal. Well, interesting to note that that, that does actually have uh, common with real tigers. Tigers, leopards, and cheetahs all have individual stripes and spots and individual as fingerprints on humans. It looks like it. Animals caught on film also have shown the iconic stiff straight tail, a trait they say shares with quals, though the native qual is much smaller. Who is more commonly, let's see. 
Animals caught on film also show the iconic stiff, straight, long tail. This is a trait they share with quolls, though the native quoll is a much smaller animal. And it's more commonly known as the spotted tail native cat. They otherwise look nothing like the Tasmanian tiger. With its dog-like head and stripy tiger bum, there is a video out there showing a dog-headed cat-like creature utilizing a hopping trot across the field, which is a gait that is known to be used by the Tasmanian tiger. And we'll look this video on our website. Also, another thylacine group, the Booth Richardson Tiger Team, shared imagery that appears convincing. Though the wildlife expert Nick Mooney believes the animal in question may be a spotted qual. He admitted, however, that he felt that there were a, that there was a 20% chance that the team may have actually captured a shot of a living Tasmanian tiger. But why just listen to us? How about hop into a few witness statements? We'll go ahead and include a link to the database we are accessing. Um, and you can find it at that link on our website. Well, let's look at the uh, a gentleman by the name of Brian Slee, whose brother is now deceased, who uh, researched the Thysaline by the name of Sid Slee and possibly other siblings found a dead tiger in one of their childhood snares. We were kids in 1945. We caught one in an Australian snare in our farm just outside of Bustleton. We went around to one of our snares one day and found one dead. It was just a strange animal from that bush to us, so we just left it there. Now, the story is actually believable, as many scientists now think the Tasmanian tiger possibly existed longer than the 1930s, as animal deaths would not be reported as it would have been illegal at that point. Reporting an animal's death by your hands would have resulted in penalties and possible jail time. Brian, who is now the Brusselton Historical Society president, also reported another sighting he had in 2016. <clears throat> I quote, we were driving around the Queen Elizabeth Avenue heading into town about 8.30 p.m. on Christmas Day when something trotted off in front of our car, Mr. Slee said. It turned and looked at us and I saw its face. At first, I was in doubt and thought, what the heck is that thing? It was about 15 feet uh, in front of the car and was about three quarters grown and about the size of a cattle dog. I was looking at a tail, which was sticking straight out like a kangaroo's tail. Mr. Slee said he had no doubt what he saw was a Tasmanian tiger. It was so plain, it was right in front of me, he's been quoted. Then we look in February of 1991, with the school bus driver with a bus load full of children saw the uh, elusive uh, creature. The animal was running along the fence line uh, alongside the bus. The driver even slowed the bus down so all the children could see the animal. In 1995, I saw one traveling through the state of forest between Rosa Brook and Market River. And this person is actually anonymous. So it was in 1995, my two friends saw exactly what I saw crossing the Mohan Highway, which is a gravel pot hold in the track through the thick forest. What we saw first looked like a skinny long dog with vertical black stripes down its back and tail. The gait was strange and its tail was stiff. It was the color of a buckskin horse, sort of beige. It bounded across the road approximately 20 meters in front of our car. There are no dogs which have had stripes like the one we saw, and none of the uh, native animals in the area fit that description. The caves have, uh, have yielded the Thysaline remains dated around 20,000 years old. I know I wasn't having a freaky vision because my two friends saw the same thing. This encounter took place in 1996 by a monk named Tony James at New Norcia's Benedictine Monastery. A strange animal actually entered a building on a property near New Norcia, which is located approximately 132 kilometers northeast of Perth. The encounter happened at 5 a.m. on the morning of the 2nd of August. 
As the animal entered through one door, a man entered through another door at exactly the same time. The man and the animal both froze and observed each other eye to eye for several seconds. The animal was silent during the encounter, although the man did have a glimpse of some of its teeth. The animal looked lean and almost malnourished in appearance. It also looked quite fierce. After a few seconds, the animal turned side and the man noticed a long, thin and pointed tail, which was covered by fine, short hair. The predominant color of the animal was gray with some brown and white flecks or spots. The overall color impression was described as motley. The animal finally turned around towards the door it had entered and went down on its back haunches, like a kangaroo or a big cat. It then sprang with great fluidity and grace away. The animal had a broad dog-like head and extremely long pointy snout. Its eyes were bright and intelligent looking. Its total length from nose to tip was approximately three feet and stood two feet at the head. It had small precise paws paws, not pals. The man was approximately eight to 10 feet away from the animal and saw it for 10 to 15 seconds. The man is 100% sure that the animal was not a feral cat, dog, or mangy fox. The animal resembled a thylacine, except that it did not appear to be any tiger stripes across the rump. The man has been leaving scraps and chicken bones out for the magpies and suspects that the animal had been coming for free food. Um, to me, it sounds like it's that spotted cat that you mentioned earlier, because mm -hmm. it does say here that he did, it did have spots on it, not stripes. So mm -hmm. I'm thinking that's what it was, not the thylacine. Also, a gentleman named Tristan E. Kelly reported, in 1996, I was a passenger in a car and we were about 200 kilometers north of Perth. The time was roughly 8.30 p.m. We came over a slight hill and then in the distance we could see what we first thought was a dog on the road, but as we got closer, we could quite clearly see it was not a dog. By the time the car was close enough to fully see the animal, it had moved over to the shoulder of the road and was illuminated by the headlights. The, annual, the animal had several dark stripes across its lower back and it was a Tasmanian tiger. If one can survive out of the scrub in this area and not be seen regularly, then I am certain they are not extinct. And we also have a report for 2019 uh, with an Australian farmer by the name of Peter Groves. He spotted what appeared to be a Tasmanian tiger out, uh, on a walk, out for a walk. It was actually his second sighting within weeks but this time he pulled out his cell phone to take a picture. Now, Kim, if you pull, uh, pull up that, uh, that picture here, uh, get to see that this creature that it stood on the local hill and they watched each other for five minutes before it walked off. It does kind of look like uh, what could be possibly uh, what we've seen before of a thysaline. We can also take a look at uh, a... Uh, Photo circulated around Melbourne uh, back in 1964. A local woman, Rilla Martin, captured an image that still debated today. She was on holiday visiting her cousin when she decided to take a drive down a dirt road. She noticed an odd looking animal alongside the road, managed to pull it quick to a quick stop, grabbed her camera, and with her hand shaking, she managed to snap a photo as it raced off into the brush. The animal has been discredited as a hoax by those who claimed it was too stiff, the image too clear and less strategically obscured by enough to hide the shape of the head. Yet others claim it's clearer than many of the images taken more recently with the cameras that are certainly more advanced. Miss Martin has always insisted that the actual photo she had taken, but she was often doubted, championed, and then doubted again, mostly because of several versions of her stories. One states that she had filmed processed when she got back home and then mailed the image to her cousin, telling him, here's the creature I saw that day. 
while another version says that the cousin is the one who developed the photo and then took it to the newspapers. Another version says she's the only, the only one who went to the papers. The story has been lost for time to time for years as the creature hadn't been held as a Tasmanian tiger, but rather called the Ozen Kaduk tiger. Kaduk? Ozen Kaduk tiger. This one will probably never be figured out as some claim there are supporters on the ground holding the animal upright. There's no doubt that it's a three-dimensional animal and not painted to cut out as some sites have suggested. The animal may or may not have been uh, that of a live thysaline, uh, a poorly stuffed one, or something stitched together from a variety of animals. The fact is that it has tiger-like stripes, which seem to stand out clearly in the image, were not even noticed by uh, Rilla at the time. The only images that exist now are copies, mostly scanned from newspapers. Now, according to the research, uh, Rilla has misplaced the original negative shortly after it's developed, and the newspaper lost their copy ages ago. Let me go ahead and share that also. Okay. Looking at the body, it does kind of look like it, but as it mentioned, you really can't see the head in this mm -hmm. photo, so you can't really make it out. Um, if this is the head here, it looks like it's rather very short for the body. So it, it's got me, a it looks, shorter snout. Yeah, it looks very disproportioned in my opinion. Mm -hmm. I hate to say it, but this leads us to the darker side of cryptozoology. Australia's night parrot is now considered to be the holy grail for Australian bird watchers as its nocturnal activity minimal numbers and remote habitat makes it extremely hard to find. Though they were thought to be extinct for over 100 years before one was spotted in 1979, there have only been a handful of sightings since then, and no one denies its existence now. This is thanks to clear photographic evidence and for recent discovery of a couple of small pockets of breeding birds spotted by groups of rangers. Hopes are high that despite predation on the ground by feral cats, this bird can claw its way back from its extreme endangered status. Now I'm sure that the night parrot itself would prefer you to keep, its, uh, keep your claws out of it. I only bring up the night parrot to talk about the controversy that can happen amongst those who hunt for cryptids. The first clear photographic proof of the night parrot's existence was submitted by John Young back in 2013. Heralds and accolades came in 2016 as he was awarded a senior field ecologist position at the Australian Wildlife Conservatory. However, it turns out that Mr. Young had a series of questionable claims behind him. In 1980, he claimed to have rediscovered the extinct parrot, but couldn't show any evidence. In 2006, he announced the discovery of a new species that he called the blue fronted fig parrot. But his photographic evidence was highly questionable as he had edited the images and deleted the originals before submitting them to scientific community. Scientists suspected that he had simply swapped a red-fronted fig parrot from the original coloring to blue. Photoshopped. Photoshopped. By the time his photo of the night parrot came before the Audubon magazine, he was already riding high on praise and redemption. Unfortunately, unlike the photo he had previously submitted to the other publishers, he sent Audubon the uncropped original image. Now, the magazine didn't catch it, but the readers sure did, as they spotted an aviary, aviary mesh in the corner of the photo, and Young became the center of a scientific crap storm. The accusation came that he had illegally ca captured the bird and given it its cage stillness for the photo, and he had even perhaps imaged, injured it. 
Further checking found that the audio recordings he claimed to capture were actually made by playing audio files already on record near his own recorder. The photographs he claimed to be of the night parrot nest were found to be staged using eggs made from plaster or clay. Yes, Young had rediscovered the night parrot, but he fell from grace and resigned from his post completely discredited. His claimed observations of the buff-breasted button quail, also endangered, were pulled from all scientific records as well, as he could no longer be trusted. So that really leaves us with one further question. Why does the thylacine still grip our imagination so much? I think that could possibly uh, be best be answered by our last example of an eyewitness by the name of Cole Bailey, an Australian landscaper. He had first spotted the Tassie about 50 years ago on a canoe trip in 1967. He could not just get that experience out of his head. He packed up all his things and talked to his wife into relocating to Tasmania in 1990. He has dedicated the last three decades of his life searching for the elusive uh, creature on Tasmanian soil. soil. He eventually was hailed as an expert on the species, though he refuted the title. Cole, who passed away in February of this year, wrote three books on the thysaline and was working on a fourth. He spent his years interviewing trappers and bounty hunters from the 1920s and 30s, people who actually hunted and handled the creature in the wild, as well as going out on his own expedition to track the elusive creature down. His work is now much all that remains from the days when the Tasmanian tiger still roamed the land, as those old timers are now long gone. In fact, it was one of those old trappers who told Cole the noises that the tiger made, how the creature smelled, how it moved, and the areas it once hunted in. Following their inspiration, he was able to hear thysalines in the Tasmanian wild in 1995, and shortly afterwards saw one. He said, the experience convinced me without a shadow of a doubt, they still exist. Mr. Bailey felt the obsessive over the Th Th Tasmanian tiger, showed people are still dealing with the shame over its fate. People still want for them to be out there, he said. There's a sense of shame with the older generation that we wiped them out. We killed the last tiger. Knowing the exotic hunters would definitely be interested in how science would love to get a hold of a live specimen to study, he didn't share his experience with his wife until 19 years later. It wasn't that he didn't trust her, but it was rather his attempt to protect the creature from entrapment or predation which so it's safer to tell no one at all. He was noting less and less sightings uh, being reported and wasn't hearing their calls much in the wild. The last time he heard a Tasmanian tiger call in the wild was back in 2008. In one of his later interviews, he shared how thrilled he was with the recent accounts of a sighting and people's continuing interest in the animal. While it strengthened his faith in the animal's continued existence, he felt he was now too old to be building around the bush. Quote, knowing what I know, I'd love to turn back the clock 30 or 40 years and be back out in the bush. While he was happy about the recent sightings, he's been quick to point out, many people don't know what they're looking at. Like can play strange tricks on people's imagination. So who knows? You can't rule out entirety, but people do get carried away. Why asked, he thought the number of sightings have dropped. He said, it's impossible to say why. Maybe there are less tigers left, but I believe the animal has moved back further into the wilderness. There are vast untapped area of Tasmania, rough areas where no one goes, which I think would be a good thing. It's better left them on their own and let them survive. And that's what we would leave on our thoughts, our emotions, and the fact of who knows, it may be the, the creature may still be out there, but think about it. Uh, we've got the gorillas in Africa. 
we know they exist, but they are just so isolated and keep themselves out of harm's way many a times, you know. So do you think they're still out there? I think they might be still out there. I think so too. I think like it said, like he said, um, they've moved further into the brush. I mean, there's a lot of wilderness in Australia and Tasmania that, you know, it's very rough terrain in places where we as humans wouldn't dare to travel. And I'm sure there are some still out there somewhere. Definitely. So we hope you all enjoyed our information about the Tasmanian tiger and the possibility that it could still exist somewhere in the wilderness. It still is one of our favorite creatures. Yes. Um, as usual, we do post our podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, pretty much anywhere where podcasts can be found. Um, if you like it, please rate us. What ratings do we like, Rick? Five. Uno, dos, tres, cuatro, cinco. Cinco. Un, dos, tres, cuatro, cinco. I try, try. Five stars. <laughs> yes, we do like five stars, but we will take whatever you give us. Um, also, if you rate us, please review us. And we do read reviews on air. So it'll give you a chance to get your shout out. Um, if you do have any questions for us, you can reach us at info at skepticpsychic.com, which is our email. Also check out our website, skepticpsychic.com and our Facebook group, Skeptic Psychic. Is there anything that I missed? No, I don't think so. Well, is there anything that you'd like to add before we close the show? Not really. Okay, well, in that case, we love you and good night, everybody. Sweet dreams. And unpleasant nightmares. Good night, everyone. Good night. <laughs>